Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. Today, I have an artist on the show who's been on the show before, and when we first met, he had told me about uh, Kindle publishing and doing different types of no-content, low-content books. And he was working on doing a coloring book. You can actually add images to a book, upload it to Kindle Publishing, and put it out as a coloring book. I thought that was fascinating. And he was in the process of making one. Since then, he has made quite a few of them. He's got adult uh, coloring books and uh, children's coloring books, and they're all in the background of what he likes to do, which is uh, monster movie type artwork. He's made a few books since then. We talk about those. He has a new one that just came out and a new drawing series that he's just started, which is Drawing Goths. And he's also got a book coming out that is coloring book themed for that. Plus, he has another book called Nats in a Hat. And it's even got an audible version of the book. So I have him back on just because I've been following his his Drawing Goths live feed on YouTube. And it's fantastic. So if you haven't yet, check it out. He's... Uh, He's got just a whole setup that really sort of goes with the theme of drawing goths. And we talk about how he finds the goths that he draws. He, he searches for images and he's even met some of the, the goths that he's drawn from pictures that are in the 80s. And it's a fun conversation. And I, was I always love it when I get to have artists back. So if you've ever been on the show before and you want to come back or you have something to talk about, let me know. And one way to do that, ha, see what I did there, is to go to Tom Ray's website, Dot com, and that's where you can check out the podcast. If this is the first time you're listening to it, subscribe to the podcast there. Find all of my daily autobiographical web comics that I do, that I put out about just something that happened in my day, plus my blog and vlog that I have about just things that I'm doing during the day and also how I sell and uh, find pop culture items that I like to make money with to help me kind of do what I'm doing along with the artwork and the podcast and all that kind of stuff. So go to TomRaysWebsite.com to check all that out. But now here is my interview with Ben Walker Story on today's Tom Ray's Art Podcast. Walker story and I'm an illustrator turned YouTuber streamer author now first of all you're lo are you still located out no you moved last time I talked to you where did you move to again yeah we talked when I was living with my mother uh, had the whole family living with her uh, up in the foothills of Northern California so we moved about a half hour away to buy our own place mm -hmm. yeah so it's called Grass Valley Okay. And I remember when you moved to, there was a house that was right by you that was very, I want to say Adam's family-esque and you and the family went and took pictures in front of it, if I remember correctly, <laughs> making that oh, up. Did I talk to you after we just bought this house? Maybe. I yeah, there's, um, there's, we were just talking last night actually about how much this, this neighborhood has changed. It's really been fixed up. And I think us being here was kind of part of that, but the whole block, um, you know, has changed hands as far as who owns the buildings and everything's gotten fixed up. And it's not like, it's not so tempting for the ne'er-do-wells to just kind of hang out in this area anymore, you know? So it's been pretty good. The, the teenagers aren't hanging out with their uh, hot rods. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why I'm picturing like 1950s teenagers. <laughs> it's not that far from that. It's a real time warp to drive, uh, you know, we're from San Francisco originally, and I grew up in Sacramento. So once you get off, like, the main freeway, it's like I picture, like, that, you know, in the 90s when every movie would have you going through a tunnel of numbers and and zeros and ones, and there's, like, a right. swirl you going through the Internet or some time warp or something. Yeah. That's what it feels like driving even from, like, Sacramento to here up in the foothills because everything is, like, really behind the times. Like, if you bring up... Hey, you know, are you on Instagram? They're like, huh, what? I'm not that cool, you know. And everything is no, there's no like real phone culture here. I think maybe because there's bad reception, but you know, oh. the teenagers aren't looking at their phones. Um, and then so whenever it rains or snows, 
there's a parking lot near our house where they all come to do their donuts and tear around in their monster trucks. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I mean, I'm sure it's not, but I just love that. I, I mean, I, I very much picture that exactly what you're talking about when you say that. But you're liking it there still, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we felt like we lucked out when the pandemic hit that we had a place to hunker down that isn't living with my mom, right? Mm -hmm. That isn't San Francisco where, you know, it is so densely populated and you're paying to be in a walk-in closet of an apartment for no reason now, you know, what, what is the business opportunities of, of living or the social opportunities of living in San Francisco or a big city when, right. when the pandemic on and you can't really take advantage of that. So we were feeling lucky that we could hunker down here. And for, we were just talking about how, you know, for a long time, even into the summer, it was feeling like it hadn't touched us yet, you mm -hmm. know, as far as the numbers of people sick and everything. But now it's, you know, it's just everywhere. And you, we were, we were always, you know, 10 steps ahead of everybody else as far as our carefulness levels, Yeah. you know, our anxiety levels about it all. Uh, but, you know, that said, the numbers of people getting sick caught up to us here. Um, so we can't feel as, you know, secluded. But, yeah, once things open up, I would like to maybe be somewhere where there's more culture going on. You know, there's there's nothing happening here. Mm -hmm. And. The one thing, it, in much like myself, it, the one thing that the pandemic didn't really do for you is change too much about what you did because a lot of your stuff is online based, just like mine was, mm -hmm. and and so you were uh, a little background first. Like when I last talked to you, when you were on the show last time, the thing I was doing was I was self publishing books, but then I talked to you and you were self publishing books, but you were making no low content books. You were making yeah, no content. Yeah. And and I remember you telling me that and it like opened my eyes. I was like, wait, what? And thinking about it, it's like, duh, they're, they're still books. What else can you put in them to make them like every, when you think of publishing a book on Amazon, you're like, well, I got to write something. I got to come up with my idea. I got to do a story. I actually got to publish a book. And you were at, you had just done a notebook, a lined horror themed notebook. And since yeah. then you've been doing more now. I would like to talk, well, first of all, your background is uh, the illustrations you do are a lot more monster based before we get into that. So like the background, when we talked last time was you had done stuff for like, um, what for like some of the monster magazines. I discovered my whole, like, I realized how much of an opinion I had on that look on that subject matter as far as like old monster movies and the ads at the back of the monster magazines, yeah. you know, order the monster gloves and the, you know, the things to fool your friends with fake blood, you know, all that stuff. Like I, it just was, I gravitated toward it when I got this job at famous monsters of film land. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that whole, you know, the company wasn't what I expected it was going to be. The job wasn't what I was expecting it to be. There's a lot of like clashes and headbutting that happened. Um, so when I left, I was like, oh, good. I'm glad they didn't take any of my ideas. They didn't like implement the things that I wanted to do to kind of bring them into the next century mm -hmm. while like really paying a lot of homage to the nostalgia of it. You know, they were kind of not really on top of things like taste wise as far as like updating it in a good way. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm going to take that nostalgia and that grit and that gross smell of old magazines and all of that. <laughs> and make a brand around that. And that's all I knew at first. And that became um, Cheap Chills podcast, Cheap Chills clothing line. Mm -hmm. And then I'm still publishing these books as like a Cheap Chills label. But as far as the, po as the podcast and stuff, that's uh, not going on anymore. And um, I'm gravitating more towards my, you know, uh, obsession with drawing goths now. Yeah, so, which we're definitely going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But um, Cheap Tills is not over. My newest book that's coming out this week is um, along the lines of these low-content books. Um, you can really take advantage of stuff that's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if we talked about that last time. I probably had like plans but hadn't done anything with it yet. But you can um, go onto sites where they'll have like a list and maybe even like some PDFs or something 
of books that are in the public domain, mm -hmm. like uh, Frankenstein, you know, or or uh, I don't know, what was it? Like some of the psychologists and or like um, Fran Kafka, you know, these kind of any author that's been around, Oscar Wilde, obviously, you know, you could do like let's say Oscar Wilde, you do like a portrait of Dorian Gray, mm -hmm. and you make your own cover. And then Amazon wants you to add like a very specific stuff, like at least ten new illustrations within the book, um, some kind of editing or changing of you know to make it your version. So you're not just taking a PDF and, and putting a new cover on it. Right. But not still a lot of work. Um, so that's one thing that I'm thinking of doing is making like covers and my own versions of these these kind of old horror stories. But this time I found. Um, public domain comic books, horror comics, hmm. um, they're old enough and the copyrights have expired. They're like, you know, from these defunct horror comic publishers that were like pre-code era 50s. Yeah. And as long as you don't use like trademarked words, like I wouldn't call it like creep show or, you know what I mean, Tales from the Crypt, these kind of things that I'm right. sure are trademarked. But if you get these kind of more obscure comics, I was able to figure out how to... Um, implement this, you know, low-res stuff, turn it into high-res stuff that is colorable, and I blanked out all those speech bubbles, and so it's interior pages of horror comics that you can write yourself or color whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that took uh, about six weeks to make a 100-page book. So You're working on this now, or you've actually already published it? Because I don't recall seeing that. No, it's. Uh, I just announced it a couple of days ago on Instagram. It's been on okay. my little secret project, so it's going to come out... Um, probably be uploading it this afternoon or tomorrow. And then it'll, you know, once Amazon makes it live, it'll be a couple of days later. Yeah. No, it's, it's called the vintage horror adult coloring book. I love it. And you've already got a couple of other adult horror coloring books, right? Yeah. There was monster funk. Uh, that was the first coloring book and that was all my illustrations and it was all kind of, probably too high concept and looking back at it now, I was like, I wanted it to be funny and I wrote stuff for it and it was all uh, on the premise of you never get to hear about how the monsters smell. Right. In a movie, you know, or books, there's no smells, but you would think that a monster would smell pretty bad. Yeah. And that was the whole, that was the whole concept of the book and each page was a different monster and talking about how badly, it was, what it would smell like. Mm-hmm. And then I was hoping that people would color it with the scented markers, you know, because you can get like a nacho oh, cheese. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> I didn't if know If you mix like chocolate and nacho cheese, that's probably going to be what like, I don't know, the swamp monster smells like. It's too bad you couldn't have done something along the lines of like John Waters polyester where they had the scratch and sniff smell vision that went yeah. along with the movie when you saw like you would, you'd be able it, like, why has... There used to be such a scratch and sniff market like growing up. Yeah. Like what happened to that and what happened to that technology and why can't we utilize it in our own personal stuff? We yeah, have a kid's book that has uh, Mr. Rogers' character, the tiger, Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, and goes to a bakery and you, you scratch and sniff parts of the book to, to smell the stuff that they're baking. Okay. It doesn't work very well. I don't feel like it. I feel like maybe the chemicals are, were quietly toxic <laughs> that made it really work. Maybe. You know, now they don't work as well. They don't smell as good, but they don't give you brain damage. I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll never know because we are those people that would have gotten that. And it's like, that's just the way we are now. And going back to the uh, creating the, you, you were actually in the middle of, creating the monster funk, funk uh, coloring book when we first were taught when we talked last. So okay. you were, you were in the middle of making that and you had told me about it. And that was when I realized, or when, when you had turned me on to the whole like different sort of publishing manner that you could do on Amazon. Now, when you were doing this coloring book, what was your process? What was, how did you go about making the book? Like formatting it for a coloring book on Amazon. I guess people hearing this now are like going, what make coloring books on Amazon? Right. It's not like a separate thing. You're still making a regular book, but what's yeah. the difference in the process, I guess, to kind of explain to people. Well, let's see here. I mean, there's, there's the multi-page aspect of creating something, which was still new to me. You know, I really was used to doing shorter term projects, either like a poster for a gig. Right. Uh, or, or, you know, graphic design for a company, and then I got into doing T-shirts, but these were all these little one-offs. So doing a multi-page thing was a bit of a 
thing to get your he head around first. And the first time with Monster Funk, I was just creating one page at a time and saving out a JPEG and into a folder and then trying to kind of put them in order later. I would organize them in InDesign, Adobe. But you can use like Keynote. You know, there's free apps that you can mm. use to create a PDF. Yeah. So that shouldn't be intimidating for people. Um, but with this last book that we'll have to get into later, mm -hmm. uh, I've been using Clip Studio, and they have like their highest tier version of the of Clip Studio. It's called EX, and I figured out, oh, they let you make a multi-page book um, oh. where you set it all up, how many pages it's going to be, whatever, and then you get to kind of look at all of it, almost like um, I think. What is the app that Adobe has? I always am sad that I accidentally open it because <laughs> I never use Adobe's. Uh, lets you look at all your images more easily. Oh, like the bridge one or whatever? Or light bridge. Yeah. I think it's like bridge where you're looking at all the files mm -hmm. that are associated with your book and then you, you double click on whatever you want to work on and it brings up that page and you work on it and it automatically... You, I guess you'd hit save, and it would save everything associated with that book every time you hit save. Is that what that so does? One page or another, right? Okay. And then you double-click on the next page you want to work on, and it automatically closes the last one that you were working on and opens up the next one. So it's very like fluid, the way you can kind of bounce around from page to page, oh. see it all at the same time, and then you just export out that PDF, and then that's what you would upload to Amazon. Okay. I guess I never realized that's what that particular program did. I'd open that, that and like, what was the other one? Like not Lightworks, um, Lightroom or whatever. I never understood what those connection apps did. And I was like, I don't have time to figure it out. Cause I, the only time I ever used Adobe products when I was at, was when I was working at an office and it'd be like, mm -hmm. I don't care. I just need to finish this thing and get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Bridge. I would be, I would always, I've had like an 11 year old computer. I just got a new Mac so it wouldn't be able to really handle that. And I would accidentally click it in Photoshop and I'd be like, ah, <laughs> you know, enough bridge. I don't use it. And it's going to take forever to open up and close this thing. Oh no. So I don't really even, I think that's what you use that for. But with okay. Clip Studio, it's a comic book creation app. It it's is. It's made okay. for people who want comic books. And so I've been using that on the, the, on the Mac, uh, the console, um, since like 2016 for most of my, you know, digital drawing stuff, mm. uh, at, for the T-shirts, for the uh, gig posters, for client work, uh, I've been using it for everything. And so I got an uh, iPad Pro a year ago, and that has a full version of this Clip Studio that you can do on the iPad. And so that's what I have been doing this latest book, last couple books in. Okay, is that vector or raster? The the Clip you can Studio. You do both. It's really oh, okay. cool. Um, you, it's, I think it's more roster oriented okay. where, you know, if you're used to painting in Photoshop, you would recognize most right. of the tools, all the like photo manipulation stuff and the filters. There's some of them, but it's not really geared toward that. It's not a photo manipulation program, you know, it's for drawing and painting. Yeah. Um, but you can use vector layers and they almost it doesn't feel like illustrator where you like suddenly feel like you're working with these flat objects it feels like you're still drawing but there's more um what's the word there's more of an, an ability to edit what you've drawn and and you can shrink or grow the line width you know if it wasn't thick enough for you in areas you can just kind of thicken everything up in an area or thin it down hmm. and then you can um overlap lines and easily delete the overlap so you can get really sharp nice illustrations with the, with the vector version. Okay. Layers. And another one of the things that you made books for as well is you have a series of movie rating books. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about those. How'd you come up with that idea? I love it. Well, the first uh, notebook that we were talking about was a horror movie rating book. And I just figured niche, niche down and do what you know. So there was, some books, especially one on Amazon that clearly was doing well. And that was just to rate movies. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, well, I'll just niche down and I'll do a horror movie rating book and I'll make it look like these old, like an old famous monsters magazine. So it kind of looks like that on the interior, but um, there's really only four original pages and they keep repeating. Um, and I figured whatever you want to doodle or write down while you're watching a old horror movie, I'll give you a space to do that. So you can doodle monsters, you can 
uh, write down what you think of the acting and whatever. Yeah. Um, the jump number of jump scares. I don't remember what all I put in there. And that did all right, um, but it really only took me like a week to make. So for what you you know put into it, it's not too bad. And then so I was like, I'll, I'll do a follow up. And I already had artwork. It's so nice when you've been working for like 20 years and you have stuff laying around on your computer. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes I'll do stuff for like some dumb event that was like sparsely attended, you know, or it was just over in a night. And now you've done this whole poster for this thing that's over with five years out. And so I was like, I've already done an illustration of like a popcorn bag with a bunch of cult movies coming out, more like. You know, your cult status movies, not necessarily horror. So uh, it was like Clueless and Eraserhead and Alien and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just made it the cult movie critics book and uh, just had a couple interior pages. Oh, I made it like kind of Spinal Tap themed where I was like, you could go to 11 stars. Oh, no, you you turn the dial to 11, which is stupid because there's no dials in a book. Right, yeah, you would there's have to draw it. Dial and you could write it to 11 if you wanted to. And that, that was it for that one. Okay. Yeah, and that kind of actually follows the theme of what your podcast was that you did, is you, mm-hmm. and, you and your wife would watch old monster movie trailers or old trailers and then talk about them. And then uh, what was it? You guys would pitch your own story or something like that, if yeah, I remember correctly? Yeah. Every episode, we do something a little different. Sometimes I would want to, you know, give improv a, a stab and try to do a character, or we try to improvise a movie. Because sometimes we'd just be sitting there eating dinner and we would, like, pitch ourselves a, a screenplay, you know. And so we thought we'd do that on the show. And but mostly it was about like she hasn't seen any of these movies. You know, she's a, that's right. Not really a huge mer- movie person anyway, but she would like. You know, Grease and Grease 2 and, and Cry Baby. These are, those are kind of movies that she'd watch over and over as a kid. Mm-hmm. So she had never heard of the stuff. You know, right. before we met, she had never seen Star Wars. Um, See, now that so one like, is weird. I mean, I understand not seeing the stuff. Yeah. But <laughs> she I, knows a thing about space. See? Huh. She, she has kind of anxieties about the infiniteness of space. So she was kind of okay, avoiding valid. Space sci-fi in general you know so it was just fun to show her this stuff and she would just have these odd funny takes on on stuff and kind of roasting them usually you know yeah it was fun <laughs> but she's she's swamped now with her um vintage clothing business so oh, nice. I, try to, I try to rope her into stuff to do together because she's good on camera and she's good just naturally like a comedian kind of sensibilities with how she talks but that's not her drive you know that's not what drives her right so there's the vintage clothing uh and sells it mostly through instagram now and then people she entertains people with the stories uh through instagram right that's mostly about vintage clothing and shopping and stuff yeah and you've been you've been uh taking to youtube recently Mm -hmm. like that's that's when that's the thing that you found like i remember I don't know if you set out to do this or if you did it once and you're like holy crap that did well but i remember when you did the first drawing goths thing and you were you were actually recording it to different platforms but now you Mm -hmm. go mostly to mainly to youtube i would i would say you're doing live youtube drawings and all that kind of stuff so tell me how the idea came about for the drawing goths series that you're doing it's it's weird because it started it was like this very definitive spark moment of not knowing what the hell is going on in the world with mm-hmm. the pandemic hitting. So that was a very global thing that everybody was going through. And then for me, I had been seeking help for some like mental health issues. And I thought I had ADHD basically. Okay. Um, and things were kind of getting kind of worse as far as being able to keep track of my life and my projects and just jumping from one thing to another without without even realizing that I had left what I was working on. And I'm all of a sudden I'm in another room and I was like kind of going off sometimes and like uh, barking at people like strangers for not good reasons, you know? Okay. So it just wasn't good. So I sought out help and I was finally able to like get a diagnosis and get medication. And it turns out I just have like depression and anxiety and that can cause very ADHD 
symptoms. It can be kind of six of one, half dozen of the other for people. Like they're not sure uh, one can go with the other. So what happened is by like just getting meds basically and low dosage of, of Prozac, all of a sudden I was able to like focus on a thing oh. and enjoy drawing in a way that I hadn't in like since basically since I was a kid, you know, huh. uh, these illustrations and all these gigs and these projects that I had been working on through my entire adulthood, sometimes it'd be fun, but a lot of times it would be like kind of stressful, like I'm worried about like what people are going to think, or is this going to turn out good? Is there going to be proof that I suck if I finish this? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of unneeded anxiety wrapped up in the art making. So once I was like, medicated I was able to just like relax and enjoy myself and have fun drawing and at that same moment there was this lockdown I couldn't do the Amazon t-shirts anymore I couldn't even do the books for a while because um, they were just focusing on sending out like food and diapers to people you know to make sure that people could still get those things yeah so they, they like shut down all the extra print-on-demand stuff so I was like I'm not gonna make any money for a while, we'll be fine. You know, luckily Amanda has a job and does the uh, vintage stuff that didn't, that never slowed down. The clothing was doing fine. So I was like, you know what, I got a moment to uh, just enjoy drawing and kind of reset. Uh, I've always loved drawing out of old yearbooks. Um, there's just something about, I mean, they're not celebrities. We don't know who these people are. Mm -hmm. And there's just this grid of all these faces looking at you. And they're so small that you can just instantly see the differences of people's faces and heads, you know, and their hair. And I just love it makes me giggle like the way, oh, you've got a, like a little forehead and you got a big forehead. And your eyes are <laughs> quite better and your nose is big and your chin is little. You know, everybody instantly looks very different on almost like a cartoony level. Yeah. And so I just always loved cracking open these old yearbooks from that I have from the 60s and uh, 70s. I found one that was uh, just Shriners, so it's like old white guys you know, <laughs> with their fezes on. Okay. Through. So I would just draw faces, and you, there's no money in that. It's just to enjoy it. And then I was like, oh, I'll make Skillshare classes. I had been wanting to make a Skillshare class. But I had anxiety. Every time a camera was on me, I would get really uncomfortable to where, like... Really? Yeah, to where I was, like, making... I would always look... I wouldn't even notice un until... I mean, I didn't know that I was uncomfortable, but when I watched it back, I'd be like, oh, God, I look like I'm going to throw up. Huh. I would just be making these faces like I was just so miserable. So I was like, if I'm going to do this class, I got to get on camera more. I got to have like a lower stakes thing that I can do every day. So I started doing these little cheap chills show snippets on my Instagram mm -hmm. to where I would just talk about posters that I had done or, or whatever, just to get used to being on camera. And at first I had to, my friend Paul Frederick, he's a great cartoonist uh, over in North Carolina, he texted me and said, you should you should like cut out a picture that makes you like smile or, or makes you laugh and cover that, you know, make a hole and put it on the camera. So I found, I don't even remember who it was now. It was like a cereal box with a stupid face on it that was just silly. And then I had like a picture of a, I got a picture of the Dr. Smith from, from Lost in Space. Nice. Doing that. The pain, the pain. <laughs> <laughs> so ridiculous looking and I was like that always makes me laugh so I would just look at that instead of the lens of the camera but okay. you can't tell the difference and after a couple of weeks I stopped relying on that I didn't need that anymore and I just kept doing it and then it turned into um, drawing the year, the yearbook people and looking at looking out for like the oddballs the nerds the rockers and of course the goths mm-hmm because that was kind of who I always knew most about. I kind of would run in those circles and go to those nightclubs mostly. That's what I like to dance to, you know. So as far as knowing about that subculture, that's always kind of been my kindred spirit. Um, so then I started seeking out the goths and just drawing them. And I was still kind of fixated on the idea of making a yearbook of just goths. Right. And then I started, like, showing my process and drawing that on Instagram 
Uh, and then I just suddenly it clicked. I should, you know, I was getting so frustrated, by the way, at every turn of like, I don't know what to do. I don't know why I'm doing this. I just feel like I have to. Mm-hmm. I already started picturing like a new look for me for some reason to be on camera. Like you can be like you're more yourself if you're a ridiculous looking character. You know what I mean? I like it. It fits the aesthetic though. That's what I love about yeah. it. That and the red curtain. Like when you first started, when you say you were nervous, let me say, I've been seeing your stuff since you started out. I did not see that at all. What I saw is like, wow, dude really went full in into video. Like you had the setup, you were getting new equipment. You had new, you were trying out different mics each time. Like you were really, I'm, I'm like, he's amping up to do something when yeah. I saw you doing it. I would make these videos where I'd be like talking to my friends. I never even sent this video to anybody, but I was like, just talking to my friends. Like, why am I dressed like this? Why did I set all this up? <laughs> I bought like a VHS camera that I still want to implement. I figured out how to use a VHS camera as a oh, webcam live, which is pretty cool. It really? looks better than the webcam. Yeah. Huh. Uh, so I want to get involved in that stuff. But yeah, I didn't even know why. I just felt like I had to. And I felt like if I focus on goth culture and I, if I have like a new look or whatever, it won't matter if I look miserable. Mm-hmm. I can look, I can be myself miserable and be on camera on purpose, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and not worry about like being. I was so focused on like um, Jazza. Have you ever seen Jazza on YouTube? Yeah, he's got millions of followers. He's like the guy who draws on YouTube or paints or whatever. Does these art challenges? I have to be Jazza. I have right. to be like fun and engaging and like all peppy in order to have an art channel. Well, that's there's already somebody doing that. So you were trying to do that at first, is what you're saying. I felt like I had to. I think I was stuck in that when I was trying to make my first Skillshare class. So if you go back to that, uh, I look, you know, more uncomfortable. Uh, I'm pretty standard, standardly dressed, and there's a lot of those like jump cuts as you try to like get a sentence out. Right. Um. But yeah, for me, like. It is great knowing that I have like general anxiety disorder and that explains like so much of what I like to watch or listen to media wise, why I'm turned off by a lot of things. Hmm. And yeah, if I'm on YouTube, I don't want to watch a dude who's like, Hey, (laughs) what is going on? You guys, we are here to talk about spreadsheets. Yeah. Starts right now. Yeah. You know, like, why do you need to be so cool and up to talk about, like, spreadsheets? You know, I just want to, like, relaxed environment. So that's what I want to put out there for people who would vibe the same way, I guess. Yeah. And I really was focused on, I really want to be like, I had a dream about this. I was trying to tell my wife about last night oh. that I have always had the dream of, like, being on SNL, you know, and I would, like, write my own sketches and I would be, like, this comedic improv actor and I would be, like, funny, you mm-hmm. know. And so for a long time, I wasn't sure, like, it, should this be, like, a character, like, a thing that would be on SNL or, like, between two ferns where I'm, like, messing with people. And every time I try that to, like, be in character, it just wouldn't – I didn't like how it turned out. I yeah. don't feel like I'm an actor. So I would rather, like, just be myself. And if funny moments happen, that's great. If you look at the visuals of what I'm doing and how – ridiculous it is to call a show let's draw goths and to just do that that's i think that's funny on its own maybe mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be like any higher concept than that to be like funny you know what i mean right so it's just been like working out what it is that i'm even doing in front of the camera and yeah. why well and what you did do is kind of a mixture of the skillshare thing only it's more narrative like do you remember there used to be this artist on PBS it was this guy he had he looked like everyone's dad he had a little mustache he sat at a drawing table and he would mm-hmm. draw and while that was happening there would be a voiceover thing about a story like they'd be reading from a storybook and then you realize halfway through he's drawing the end scene of this narrative that they're drew, mm-hmm. that they're leading up to and yours is kind of like that like you'll draw and you're doing things like should i meet should you ever meet your your celebrities here's someone mm-hmm. that i met but you're drawing a goth with giant hair and an yeah. earring hanging out of his nose you know <laughs> So that's no accident. Uh, if you, if I could share my screen to you right now and find it, I would show. I have screen grabs of that guy. Okay. I, I had those set aside from the beginning, as far as like a vibe and look and feel, and that's really? why. I, that's why I got the VHS camera because I would love to like just do a show that really 
confuses people. It makes people think like, where did this, you know, where did this show come from? Are these lost VHS tapes from UP from like the UHF oh, or? And that's why you would do the VHS. Or whatever. I would love oh. to do something like that. I feel like that needs more like production people than I'm capable of doing alone right okay. now. And also to be able to tell a story and draw it at the same time, I've tried it a couple times and I'm not giving up, but it's um, it's hard to talk and draw at the same time. Very much so. So I end up not really getting through enough drawings while I talk mm -hmm. for that to really work. But maybe one drawing, like I did one last week that was one drawing of me at age 12 or whatever, and I told the story that went with that image. And that worked. Um so we'll see. I want to do stuff like, uh, you know, how to draw your own Kafka-esque um, hellscape existence. You know what I mean? Or like <laughs> these course. ridiculous, like sort of uh, goth-themed, surreal subject matter. And then I'm not going to actually show somebody how to draw that. Like how to draw you as a cockroach person. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm still figuring it out. I do love the fact that you – that's why I mean, while trying to use a VHS camera as a webcam is brilliant enough, but you saying you want to do that so it looks like it's a lost video, you're like making your own illustrated Blair Witch project. You know, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh yeah. my god! And another kindred spirit is uh, Dana Gould, who I've done a lot of posters for, and he's right. got a show coming out next month. That's the same thing. Like we clearly uh, have a lot of you know, vibe the same way as what we think we'd want to do as a show. And so his next show is going to be him as Dr. Zayas from planet of the apes, mm -hmm. which he does like in live shows a lot. And it's just, it's clearly, I'm not sure exactly what the show is going to be, but from the images they put up in the shorts, it's like he was this celebrity in the late sixties, early seventies who would have been on the tonight show sitting next to Sammy Davis jr. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Zayas and he's just one of the celebrities that was hanging out back then, you know, on the dais of somebody's roast or something, you know. So it's clearly made to look like it's some lost show. These tapes, you know, turned up. He's always been around since the 60s. Right. I like that kind of thing where you're not even sure what time period you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the Too Many Cooks uh, promo that was done at like three in the morning on Adult Swim, if you've ever seen that. It's supposed no. to look like the intro of every single 90s comedy like early 90s late 80s comedy and it's like a long song and it goes on it's like this it's like this song where it, and you should look it up afterwards after we're done with this it's called too many cooks and it is bizarre and then it gets more and more bizarre and then it gets dark and then it gets like really really dark mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's all done like in the intro of like full house or you know, oh, yeah. of Alf. It, it's, oh my God, it, you need to check it out. It ran, basically it was something that ran on Adult Swim at like three in the morning, just like out of nowhere. It wasn't announced. It wasn't planned. It was just like an 11 minute short that ran and okay. it got and somebody uh, recorded it and it's been all over YouTube now. Anyway, <laughs> that thing, but with your, with your uh, setup that you have, like I said before, your setup got really elaborate and you started getting stuff like yeah. what is your setup for doing your videos when you're recording these or doing your uh, like <laughs> tablet drawing or when you're narrating or when you're sitting at your, your, uh, your chair that you have, uh, there's mm -hmm. a chair that you sit in. Like, how are you recording those? What's your setup? Yeah, I've been sort of experimenting each time a little, doing something a little differently every time just to see what works best and feels best. You know, I thought that doing things um, analog style, like traditional media with like messy ink and stuff dripping down would be like more on brand and, and I enjoy that probably more anyway. Uh, but that's really hard to shoot. Yeah. And what I've found so far is it's really hard to like have a camera on me and the right lighting for me and properly light a piece of paper on my desk that's a foot and a half away from my face. Mm -hmm. where that's going to show up. And then it's not going in and out of focus every time I put my hand in there. Oh, yeah. It's really hard to get all set up. And so that's ended up with me like nudging things around and moving tripods and lights for like two hours in order to record a live video um, every time. So it's all set up in my, it's all set up in my bedroom right now, our bedroom. So I don't know if I can turn the, turn the camera. You'll see like, there's my bed. Oh. 
a bunch of lights that I ended up not using. So I'm just in this like one third of my bedroom where I can have a little bit of space. And it's that, ooh, when I have all the tripods and the lights, I end up having to climb over the bed back and forth in order to adjust things, and it's pretty ridiculous. So we're setting up a – we're going to build a studio out of our garage this year. Oh, cool. So that, that'll help. You can keep everything set up and ready to go, and you can just go sit down and turn everything on. Right now there's a lot of setup time every time I want to record. Mm-hmm. But that said, I love going live, and I was I I really like somebody said, oh, you should do this on Twitch, like when I first started. Right. And I was like, I don't think I can draw and talk at the same time. So for the first six months, it was faked. It was me drawing. I would record it from overhead or whatever or digitally, and then I would record a story, or maybe I would record myself in front of the camera telling the story, and then I would intercut those things to make it look like I was drawing and talking. And that's just so much editing. It was like four days of editing for oh a four God, yeah. video. So that was not sustainable. But now if I set up to do live, I love OBS. I'm really kind of used to that setup. I kind of you know, grew into that whole live internet video early on, like in the 90s. I had a job that was doing similar stuff. Hmm. They were developing similar stuff. Um, it was very instantly intuitive for me. I've done live shows drawing for like comedy uh, called Picture This, where oh. the comedian would talk, and then you would draw either what they were talking about or you kind of roast them and draw stuff to mess with them. And there was this whole back and forth, and it was for a live audience. And hmm. people loved that uh, in San Francisco. It was always a big hit. Um, it was actually out of L.A., but we were like the San Francisco branch. And I loved that. And it was weird that like I would, I was in charge of roping in other artists to, to you know, draw with me. We'd have to have like a set of, you know, four or five artists to to go through the whole lineup. Um, and most people would say no. And then, even like a lot of the artists that did a great job, who were like my friends, and I was like, oh man, you did a great job. People loved what you did. And this one guy was like, I am never doing that again. <laughs> he just hated the pressure of it. So I, that always blew me away. Cause I, I think I thrive on that. You know, I don't mind going up on stage and like doing open mics and bombing. Uh, I would rather get laughs, but there's some like adrenaline surge either way. Even if you bomb, you still get that adrenaline surge. So mm-hmm. I don't mind as much. And uh, the worse you drew with that, the better, a show you would have because people liked the stupid looking drawings, you know? Yeah. So I'm kind of doing my version of that now with these lives. Um, and that's, you know, just as much setup, but then you do it and it's done and you just put out, I just, last time it was two and two hours and 40 minutes. I, I lose track of time. Mm-hmm. I just, keep uh, I didn't, I only stopped because I realized my ass had fallen asleep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I like that more. I want to keep doing that. I want to get it so that it goes to um, YouTube and Twitch. And I might even like, it sounds like a lot of people on Twitch will do like an edited version once they're done. Mm-hmm. They'll make like a three minute version of what happened. So I'd like to do that if I have the bandwidth. Yeah. Well, there's also the thing too, where um, what I've seen, or at least what I've done in the past is stream it to Twitch and then Twitch lets you export it to YouTube as a private video, and then you can use the editor in YouTube to cut the video. The video, so you don't have to do the whole. You never have to download it. Yeah, you don't have to download it. You don't have to do the whole. Okay, now I have to wait for my file to render. You just edit it directly in YouTube, and then when it's done, publish it, and you have your like different highlights that you can create, or you can create highlights on Twitch from your reel, and then export those highlights to YouTube. You know, it's okay. one of those things, but you can't do your intros and all that kind of stuff. You have no like loading card unless you actually put it in the live stream itself. Yeah. But so there's that, but yeah, it's a different, it's a different sort of, and it can go for either way. And I agree with you, like doing the live streams, it's kind of like, okay, well, that, that went fine. Like for some reason I'll be like, oh, and this is what happened and I'm going to do it this way. It's like you're directing, knowing that you can't go back and edit it. Whereas when yeah. I set up to record something, I feel like it takes forever. I don't like yeah. the way it looks. I feel like, okay, I'll just do that again because I or I'll fix that in post. Whereas when you're doing it live, it's like, nope, you gotta figure out how are you gonna how are you gonna get yourself out of this one? You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that's exactly what you were saying. You're like you you were going, yeah, because then you gotta think one step ahead of yourself rather than like, oh, what are people gonna think of this? Is this gonna be any good? It's like, nope, yeah. you're live now. 
<laughs> there was a, I heard that uh, Bob Barker on the um, The Price is Right, you know, I heard that he would do something similar where he would mentally edit um, while he filmed. He he had like a sense or he watched the clock somehow mm-hmm. and he keeps things moving so that he could show up, record the show, it took an hour and he was done. Where if he had the mindset that, oh, we're going to edit this later, it would just drag out forever and it would mean like hanging out afterwards and making sure that things get edited correctly and everything. Mm-hmm. So if you just mentally edit and keep in mind what I can do on camera right now that's going to be okay, um, then you're done. So mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, I like that better. That's really cool. And and I I have been loving the drawing goths. And also, my, I want to say, the um, blacklight drawing thing was brilliant. That was... Oh, thanks. I feel like I didn't get any feedback on that. I wasn't sure if I should do any more. Oh, no, I liked that one. And also, it didn't... I mean, while it was one of those, like, duh, you, you were like, you have to use this type of paper because regular paper reflects. And it's like, yes, it does. So how did you how did you think to go try different textures of paper so that you could draw on it that it wouldn't <laughs> reflect in the blacklight? I don't know. if the, Maybe that's just an artist thing. I, I just kind of geek out on that stuff anyway. I want to make sure that whatever I'm working with is going to you know, work best and, and feel right for me. Mm-hmm. So I've noticed, you know, for, you know, my entire adulthood has been like figuring out, Oh, if I'm using this kind of pen on this kind of paper, this sketch pad, it just comes out differently. I can't do the same style oh. no matter what the media is. You know, if it's, if I'm drawing digitally versus on some note paper versus, you know, uh, cheap, sketchbook versus watercolor paper it's just going to look differently every time um but if i know that there's like lucky sketchbooks mm. they're like cheapest paper that you get like through utrecht when you're a student grade you know and for whatever reason if i use like a color erase pencil on that paper i'll go back through the sketchbook and realize oh there's that album cover that i did for that guy that worked out great <laughs> there's that first version of that concept that i came up with that was a huge hit all the like greatest hits were in were started in this sketchbook, and there's just something about the way that they draw. Hmm. And so that's actually the paper that works well with the uh, black light because it, I think because it's cheap, they like don't process it enough to right. be able to bounce back the UV light. Yeah. So it just kind of absorbs it, and so that works well for the for the black light drawings. Yeah, and I love too. It didn't occur to me till the end of the video. You flip over one of the drawings you're doing, and then you draw on the back, and it's like, oh yeah, because it'll go through the paper, and it but it'll be faded. And he had like the glow lines yeah. around. Yeah, no, that was brilliant. I loved it, and it was in it the look of it too, because it looked like you were drawing with glow sticks, because mm-hmm. the highlighters were also shining in the light. No, I really yeah, enjoyed yeah. that video. Yes, yeah. <laughs> That one was, yeah, that wasn't a good one. So what's your schedule for doing your live drawings? Do you have a set schedule or are you just kind of doing them when you think of them? I'm transitioning now uh, in, from going kind of incognito without any warning just to practice, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> Which I've heard uh, advice to like do it 10 times live before you tell anybody. And I've probably mm-hmm. gone live five times now and then started telling people, that I'm going to do it. And that so far hasn't really mattered. I'll have like a friend or two show up um, to, to watch the lives. It, it seems very difficult to get people to go from like one platform to another, like tell people on, on Instagram yes. and have them show up on YouTube seems to not work so far. But uh, anyway, yeah, Friday mornings so far is, is working really well. I'll go uh, 10 o'clock on Fridays, which is Pacific time. Uh, I would like to start doing it more like two or three times a week so I can really kind of bust through all the subject matter that I want to talk about. Uh, I don't seem to have any problem rambling about a subject once I've written down a couple bullet points. Yeah. Um, which I wasn't sure about for, like I said, for a long time, I wasn't sure if I could talk and draw at all. Um, so yeah, I need to come up with a couple more times. I, ideally I'd love it to have it like where, you know, say three times a week and each, each, um, day of the week it would be a little bit of a different vibe or subject matter you know where one would be maybe more instructional about drawing and one would be more about like life and love uh, mm-hmm. or have a guest on and we would both draw together and be more like a party you know that kind of thing I, I would love to do something just like a I thought about doing like a dance party where you just have like cool music mm. 
turns out you can't get like the copyrights and you can get shut down for that right. sort of thing. Yeah. I yeah. You can't do that. <laughs> and I tried to have like some decent music going while I just drew. And I don't think that that resonated for people and it didn't feel right for me either. So I don't think I want to do that anymore, but yeah, just still kind of figuring out format. Get one of those old Casio keyboards uh, from the eighties and just turn that on and have the, have the repeating like song that it has. <laughs> yeah. The, the sample, no, it was called demo, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> just put that on in the background. I, I it's so hard to like, you know, decide what to focus on and to set all your other interests aside has always been a problem for me. And I have to feel like I have to really be careful to not jump into too much stuff. But I, I love, I've done a lot of like electronic music, especially like in the late nineties mm, okay. like and uh, these other loop programs, the fruity loops yeah. started coming out. Um, and so that actually, by the way, here I got to do with something. I got to do a video on this subject of like, don't feel guilty about your interests being spread out, um, because yeah, I have had spread out interests. I used to in the '90s make these electronic songs, and I wasn't really drawing and painting much back then. Okay. And then I went to school, and I had to stop doing that, and I had to just draw every day and paint every day, and set everything aside, and then. You know, I would sculpt or do like soldering projects and like make my own, you know, circuit bent interest, uh, circuit bent instruments. And I always felt like guilty, like I'm too spread out, and I'm not like a master at anything. Well, that's true, but you know, now I can take all those things and I can like lump them all into one thing. Mm -hmm. I can do timeline based editing because I'm used to it from like acid in these, these music programs in the nineties. So I knew how to like work with, you know, flash and, and, uh, after effects and these kind of things are all time life based editing. Mm -hmm. I was already able to like jump right into that stuff. And now I can do YouTube videos cause of that stuff. And I know about audio enough to be able to get by and I know when it sounds bad or it's distorting or if it's too echoey, I can work on that. I can hear it, you know? Um, I know how to draw. I can implement that. Um, I've done stand up. I love stand up and, and performing and stuff. And I try to like implement that experience and not be nervous anymore in front of the camera for my taking my experience from that. Mm -hmm. I've done live stuff with that. So now I can take all those things and turn it into a thing that I couldn't have done in the late nineties, you know, or, the, or 2000. Exactly. So it all works out if you just keep doing what you want to do, I think. Yeah, I know. I agree. It, and all of those, I've said that so many times on different subjects as well. And then also I wanted to find out what, uh, what do you have coming up? What are some of the projects aside from the, the, you know, doing the live streaming and everything? Do you have any other big projects, any new books or anything coming out or any other types of things you'd like to tell people before we go today? Well, the let's draw goths coloring book, uh, came out just in time for Christmas. So uh, that's been about six weeks or so. Um, so that's doing well. And uh, that was just a culmination of doing the videos and drawing um, just turned into like uh, finding real people and, and tracking them down if I could right. from these old photos. Some of some are more um, modern selfies on Instagram. So I've got like a mix of, of younger goths and alternative people that I found on Instagram and uh, I've got some older photos and I love all the old snapshots people like because they're having fun they're just living their lives and they happen to be dressed that way right I find it more interesting than the people that like get dressed up and maybe take a picture and then maybe scrub it all off I don't know what they what they do the rest of the time no judgment because uh right <laughs> um, but uh yeah, so that's a mix of, of – but what's, what was fun is finding the real people whenever I could. I made, like, a lot of internet friends that way, and I've been in contact with all these uh, um, middle-aged goth types, you know. That, I did uh, see you do the call-out for them when you were looking yeah. for people in these videos yeah, or in these photos, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so – I, it would be cool to do a follow-up of that. I don't know if people want a sequel of more goths or if I should maybe branch into other subcultures, you know, maybe all rockabillies. I don't know. Um, but as far as, like, what I'm working on next, it's all in sort of, like, the daydreaming phases a little bit. But, okay. Uh, 
I had, you know, I had this other YouTube show idea that way goes beyond um, before this stuff that was more animation oriented um, that takes advantage of some uh, animation that's more like puppet based and you can even do it live right oh. and so now that I'm getting better at doing stuff live I might and I have better equipment now that will be able to handle this software um, I might try to jump back into that um, and that would be more along the lines of cheap chills Mm-hmm. A new Cheap Chills show, perhaps. Okay. Um, that's more animation based and more about old movies again. Um, but I need to I need to jump into messing with that, and or I would love to take those same kind of characters and and ideas and make a like a graphic novel, like an anthology, a horror anthology, but like oh, cool. my, you know, uh, I, because I love both and it's really hard to. I don't know if you can like do both at the same time, really, but um, especially when you have like a small kid that you're taking care of. But right, um, yeah, I, I would like to do one or the other and have that kind of feed some audience into the, the other version. You know, the print right. or the videos. Probably videos first, but we'll see. Nice. And then, if people wanted to check out your stuff, where should they go to find you? Well, I'm on Instagram at Ben Walker Story with an E-Y. Uh, there's also an Instagram of just the photos of these people that I find that's just at Let's Draw Goths. Hmm. Uh, that might turn into more artwork, um, but for now it's just the photos. And then I'm on YouTube. Uh, I think my handle on there is Mega Big Time or something, but uh, that's old and dumb so just if you just search let's draw goths or ben walker story it seems to come up on youtube yeah actually it is ben walker story it looks like good <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben walker story on youtube i just changed that and it seemed to like it took a while to implement so i didn't want to say right good <laughs> and uh yeah and my portfolio is ben walker uh art before I was a story, I got that. So that's benwalkerart.com. And that's got all the comedy gig posters and stuff, which we probably talked about last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's all. That's where I am. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming back here. And I was so excited to find out more about the stuff that you've been doing since I last talked to you. Thanks for asking me back. Mm-hmm.